Hi, everybody. Hi, my name is Helen. Um, I'm a student at College of the Atlantic, and I'm really honored to welcome all of you here today and all of you that are joining us remotely um, to this 10th session of the 2021 COE Summer Institute. Um, we here under the tent today are on unceded and stolen land belonging to the Wabanaki people. And so it seems appropriate to talk about the importance of indigenous sovereignty over the land and the food systems connected to that land. I'm therefore very excited to introduce today's conversation between Venona Laduc and Sarah Alexander on their work on indigenous food sovereignty with the White Earth Land Recovery Project. The central mission of this project, and this is from their website, so I'm just quoting this, is to, quote, restore the original land base of the White Earth Indian Reservation while preserving and restoring traditional practices of sound land stewardship, language fluency, community development, and strengthening our spiritual and cultural heritage, end quote. With us here today in person is Sarah Alexander, who is currently the executive direct director at MOFGA, the main organic um, Farmers and Gardeners Association. Um, she's a graduate of Northwestern University and has been doing food systems related work for 20 years. Um, beyond working, working with Benona LaDuke on the project that I just mentioned, um, she's been working with the Green Corps, she's been a farm apprentice, she's been working with the American Community Garden Association helping develop an urban agriculture program and with Food and Water Watch advocating for strong organic standards and consumer labeling. Please join me in welcoming Sarah to the stage. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having me, and I'm so excited to be here this morning. Thank you for everybody coming out on this um, pretty chilly, rainy morning, and thank you for everybody who's tuning in online. We really are excited to have this conversation. I'm excited to, to reconnect with Winona this morning and have the conversation um, about food sovereignty. And I also want to thank Helen and the College of the Atlantic um, for inviting me here and, and for doing a land acknowledgement this morning. I want to mention, even though we're not going to be talking much about the food systems of the tribal communities here in Maine, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, and the Abenaki, um, there are many, many projects that are happening here in Maine to restore food sovereignty and traditional food systems. And I want to acknowledge the resilience and the fortitude of those communities in resisting genocide and settler colonialism for hundreds of years um, and continuing to thrive today and create a stronger food system for all of us. So thank you for all of the work that they do. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Winona LaDuke, um, who I worked with for a number of years, um, uh, starting about 20 years ago. I was a college student when I first met Winona. I led a group of students up to the White Earth Land Recovery Project to work in the maple sugar bush, um, hauling maple syrup for a week, and met Winona and was immediately inspired um, and excited by the work that she was doing and she saw in me somebody who had a lot of rural life skills <laughs> that could be useful um, in her work and invited me to come back up and that started a long-standing friendship relationship mentorship um, I every opportunity I had during my college years after meeting Winona, I went back up to White Earth uh, to work with her uh, at the White Earth Land Recovery Project. I helped work on her first organic certification for her berry farm um, and helped with many things over the years and was very excited to be invited back um, after I had some campaigning experience under my belt to uh, work on a campaign with her to stop the genetic engineering of wild rice, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today. Um, but let me tell you a little bit more about Winona. I know her personally um, and know all the, the ins and outs, but let me tell you a little bit more about who she is and what she's done. So she, if you, if you don't know her, is an internationally renowned activist. She works on issues of sustainable development, renewable energy, and food systems, and has been a leader in these issues for many, many years. She lives and works on the White Earth Reservation, which is in Northwest Minnesota. 
and she's a two-time vice presidential candidate with Ralph Nader for the Green Party. Um, Winona, when I first met her, had just finished her, her run for the Green Party in 2000 and um, had a very a small child, um, Gwekan Ahmad, and used to say she was the only nursing vice presidential candidate in the history of the US, and I think that's still probably true today. She was the founder and program director of Honor the Earth and also the founder of the White Earth Land Recovery Project um, and is still doing incredible work at White Earth and primarily with Honor the Earth around economic, environmental, and social justice for indigenous communities all across the country and all around the world. She's won many awards for her work. She's been inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. She's won the Thomas Merton Award. She was the Ms. Woman of the Year. And she's won the Reebok Human Rights Award, among others. And the White Earthland Recovery Project, during the time that I was there um, for the work that we were doing on wild rice, was awarded the 2003 International Slow Food Award for Biodiversity, a Presidia project. And Winona was invited to Italy. Um, Winona and Margaret Smith, who were an elder, went to Italy to accept that award. Um, and that started a, a partnership internationally as well around the rice producing communities and, and how to preserve those traditional rice lands. Winona graduated from Harvard and Antioch universities and she's written extensively on Native American environmental issues. She has written several books, including most recently the book, To Be a Water Protector, The Rise of the Windigoo Slayers, that just came out last year. And she's also the author of Recovering the Sacred, All Our Relations, and Last Standing Woman. Please help me in joining and welcoming Winona LaDuke. I mean, I mean, I'm going to joke, blow my relatives. And hello, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think so. Um, Ani and Buju Winona, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs> it's so yeah, great to I see, see you again. Yeah, I see you in my chair. <laughs> yeah, there was a chair right here for you, but you know, we'll we'll settle for the Zoom <laughs> screen instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so very nice to be with you today. I'm I'm sorry I cannot be in person, but these times are not times that I'm I'm able to travel. But I'm grateful to be able to be with my friend Sarah and uh, here with you. And it looks like a beautiful place. And I hope to come visit you someday in person again. You know, um, as I reflected on this opportunity to talk to talk with you, you know, we are related, and I want to send greetings to my relatives to the east, the Malice, the Malice, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddies you know, the Penobscot, so are, those are our relatives. They are all Algonquin speakers. And our people, the Anishinaabe people, originated there. You know, in our stories and in our knowledge, we are those relatives. We came from the East and we followed a shell which appeared in the sky to the place where the food grows upon the water. And that food is wild rice, our most sacred food. And it is the centerpiece of what you would call food sovereignty. It's the centerpiece of, uh, you know, our instructions, our most, uh, it's our food, first food eaten, our last, our most sacred food. Um, you know, for those who have had, not had the pleasure of eating wild rice, I encourage you to go out and, and make sure you get some native harvested what, uh, wood parched rice so you get the real thing. You don't want to get some imitation for this stuff, right? But the point is, is that it has uh, like twice the protein of, of the other rice and half the calories, you know, it's a good food and it's the centerpiece of our nutrition. Our people, it's also for our ceremonies. So our people follow this shell which appeared to the sky, to this place where the food grows on the water. And our Anishinaabe world exemplifies, exemplifies what you would call food sovereignty. You know, food sovereignty is technically the ability of a nation to, to have control over its food system, you know, and, uh, but we're not just talking about that you got enough uh, cornflakes and Pillsbury dough stuff to eat. What we're talking about is the ability to eat the foods that are intended for you, that are the foods that are part of your culture, a part of your way of life, a part of your traditions, you know, your most sacred foods. And, you know, I think a lot about the food of America. You know, my idea of when America was great was a while back. My idea of when America was great is when there was uh, wild rice throughout most of the northern states. 
that'd be when America was great. America was great was when there was 50 million buffalo and uh, 10,000 varieties of corn. Um, when there was sturgeon in every one of our lakes and passenger pigeons blackened the skies, you know, and uh, tremendous agrobiodiversity. That's when America was great. Uh, you know, a thousand kinds of potatoes, you know, that kind of stuff. That's uh, tremendous agrobiodiversity. And that greatness of agrobiodiversity is part of what colonialism removes, you know, takes away through a very systemic process. But, you know, in our people, we understand that those sacred foods are the centerpiece of what indigenous food sovereignty looks like and is, you know, in your territory, it might be, you know, wild rice and berries and fish, you know, that might be it. But for us, I would say that the cornerstones of our food systems you know, in our territory is wild rice, maple sugar, you know, um, our uh, buffalo or our deer, our sturgeon, our sturgeon in our territory, kind of like the buffalo of the rivers. That's what a sturgeon is like. And, um, you know, then all of our, all of our different food systems, that's our most traditional foods and the foods that, um, the creator gave us. And, um, you know, many times I've heard uh, people talk about what food sovereignty is, but my friend Sugar Bear Smith, who I think you met too, Sarah, he used to say, you can't say you're sovereign if you can't feed yourself. And I think about that a lot because, you know, we, we noticed particularly during the pandemic, the implications of a global food economy. And that, that's a dangerous situation in the world we live in because a global economy globalization is predicated on a lot of cheap access to fossil fuels largely and energy and so for instance you could eat a shrimp that was raised in scotland deveined in china and arrives at a walmart near you mm. that's what we got to so that's like this food system that it turns out that in the time of a pandemic for instance or maybe some other cataclysmic uh, catastrophe ahead of us or underway, you know, you can't get all the stuff you thought you needed. And so, you know, food sovereignty is that ability, ability to be resilient in your food systems to feed your people. And it's not just a bag of rice or a bag of, of uh, hot Cheetos. It's the good stuff. That's what we're talking about. Now, I want to talk particularly about Anishinaabe food sovereignty and, and I think about it, and I was talking to Sarah about it last yesterday, about how, you know, how people view the world that they live in. And Anishinaabe people, and, and you know, I think a lot of our relatives to the East, we talk about inda a king amin, inda king amin. That means a king is the word for land. And inda king amin means the very land to which you belong, the very land to which you belong. And it's not private property, it's not state ownership, it's certainly not corporate ownership. It's this relationship and this, this reciprocal agreement you have, this covenant you have with the land, that you take care of the land and the land takes care of you. You know, and you, you take care of your relatives, whether they have wings or fins or roots or paws. Um, you take care of them because if you take care of them, they will take care of you. And that is like really the reciprocity that exists in an indigenous worldview is you keep good relationship with your relatives and it'll be good. And I think that wild rice really exemplifies that in many ways because, um, you know, wild rice requires a good lake and good water levels to take care of it. It requires prayers and then it's okay. You know, and why do I talk about this? Because you know, for where I live, you know, uh, you know, wild rice, like buffalo, and like sturgeon, and like passenger pigeons, had a much larger range once. You know, it was everywhere, and uh, now it's very little. And what we have of wild rice is mostly there in in the North Country, in Anishinaabe territory. You know, in the kingdom, in the very land to which we belong, is the wild rice bowl or the wild rice territory that is around the Great Lakes, you know? And so what little bit we have, you know, we, we, we take care of. And, um, you know, I was raised uh, with rice forever, you know, and I always say I'm here because of wild rice. You know, my parents met because of wild rice, 
you know, so I'm very grateful to rise because that's why I'm here, you know, but I say that and we live in the heart of it and, and we understand, you know, uh, you know, I saw pictures today on the sacred Facebook where people had put up pictures of how the rice was doing on different lakes to give people an update, you know, it looks like this here, it looks like this here, looks like it's a few weeks out, looks spotty, you know, so interesting. And it's so also precarious because climate change really affects your wild rice. You know, a torrential storm like anything else that is a food system can get wiped out, you know. But the thing about wild rice is the same thing with agrobiodiversity. And the Irish potato famine should have taught us that, is that you want a lot of diversity. And so the wild rice that we have is is different. You know, some lakes is a little different than others. Some's t short and some's, some's uh, you know, uh, tall and some's like short of grain and the river rice is short of grain and the lake rice can be longer of grain. And, um, you know, it's in a little bit different conditions. So if a storm hits, it doesn't hit all your rice, it hits maybe one place, you know? And then what that did is I put the rice back in the lake. <laughs> so come back next year, you know, so that's a good way. Sorry to interrupt with the Zoom. The Zoom thing might be a little awkward here, but I'm gonna, I just wanna take a minute to, you know, here in, in Maine, there used to be wild rice, but those stands really don't exist anymore. So for those of us here in Maine, um, for folks who maybe have never seen wild rice before, um, you know, can you just talk about the the vast <laughs> landscape and lakes that are just co covered with wild rice and what that looks like? And then also, you know, the traditional techniques that are used to to manage that rice and to harvest it and process it to give us a sense yep. here in Maine. Yep. OK, so we have a lake called the uh, Lower Rice Lake, uh, which is pretty much covered with wild rice. That's the mother load of wild rice on our territory. But the, and the thing about rice is that it, it ripens at different times in different lakes. And a lot of times it ripens further south earlier. So right now the sandy flowage is looking pretty good. Looks like Shell Lake is coming in good. Uh, Lower Rice Lake is coming in later. You understand what I'm, I mean, I think that's really important to understand is the, as the diversity. And so it looks like, you know, first time you see it, you think it's a pasture. No, and I'm like, no, that's a lake. It looks, it's a grass, Zizania aquatica, I think it's called. And it's a grass that grows on the lake. And you know, um, this, um, this Thai rice farmer came to see me one day. You know, who we met these people through slow food, other people trying to protect their wild rice, you know, from genetic engineering. That's how I met all these people. I didn't know anything about genetic engineering until, you know, that. When they, the University of Minnesota announced that they want to try to genetically engineer our wild rice, that's what we first heard about. We we're all like, what's that? What's genetic engineering? That sounds like crazy people do stuff. You know, but anyway, so we meet these people in Europe and this Thai rice farmer comes to see me and he says, where's the rice? And I said, uh, it's over there on the lake. He said, wait, where's the rice? I said, it's on the lake. And I take him down and he looks at the lake. And then I realized that he spent his whole life in a rice paddy. Like a lot of the world spends a bunch, a lot of their time taking care of their of their rice in their rice paddies. And us, we don't, we don't, we just have to take care of our lake. <laughs> and then the rice is there, or it isn't there. And um, the rice is really resilient. My companion Don, he tells me about how uh, there was a lake here called Onamia Lake. And uh, there was no wild rice because the, the non-Indian landowners were on that lake and they raised the water levels so that they could have their boats around and they drowned out the rice, you know, so that they could be all fancy in their boats. Well, you know, they had a drought. And one year that rice came back, uh, 17 years later. Another lake came back 50 years later. So what does that tell you about the resilience of wild rice? I think it's, oh, hold on a second. A phone is going off there. Well, Sorry while you're talking, that. yeah, that's all right. Um, yeah, so talking about, about the resilience, is, yep. Go ahead, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's Sorry, it's very resilient. Sorry about that. I forgot the phone was there. Um, it was very, it's very resilient. And so 
it grows on a lake and uh, you just got to take care of the lake at night. That's when I really understood like how special Ojibwe people were. <laughs> that you could have your main food and you just got to take care of a lake. And then you go out there, you put your prayers out and around August it comes in. You know, in our territory, it's called uh, Monomenike Gizus, the wild rice making moon. That's what you call it in August, you know. And uh, right now we're in, in Mean Gizus, which is the blueberry moon. And before that was Odeman Gizus, strawberry moon. I'm also trying to point out that you have a worldview that's based on food sovereignty. You know, I didn't have any, I don't have any calendars named and months named after Roman emperors in my calendar. They're all named after like important berries and things, you know, see more long, have more longevity than Julius Caesar or something. But um, so our rice comes in and then we go out and we put our prayers out. We check on the rice, we put our prayers, our tobacco out, and then we go out on the lake with two sticks and a canoe, you know, like an old town canoe. Someone actually gave me an old town canoe this year. Very nice for ricing. You know, take out my old town canoe and I go out there on the lake and uh, and Don will pull me and uh, you stand up and go like this and push through the rice, you know, with a duck bill on the bottom of a long stick. You know, I'm just trying to say, you know, to push along because you can't paddle there because the rice is so much. And then the person in the back, where's our, we got some knockers here. You know, you, you knock the rice in and you knock it into the into the into the canoe like that. And that's how you harvest the rice. And, um, you know, our, our communities go camp down there or we just go out there, we rice all day. And then at the end of the day, you bring in your rice. And, you know, Sarah, you did the same thing with me. You could buy 500 pounds of rice off a guy on the rice lake. You know, this is, a, this is like a lot of rice you could feed your families with. And uh, when that rice comes in here, I have to illustrate for you, this would be a rice knocker. There's two of them. They look kind of like drumsticks. They're about uh, 30 inches long, made of cedar. This is my a rice knocker. And you knock the rice into the, the, into the canoe like that. And then you take it and you parch it over, let it dry a little bit so it's not soggy because you don't want to try to parch soggy stuff. And then you put it in the giant, uh, you know, you could do it in an old time kettle, an akik, which would be a copper kettle or, uh, 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 you know, uh, you could do it in, a, in a, a cast iron kettle or else you do it over a parching, which is like these big giant um, barrels and you turn them over the fire for about two and a half hours. And then at the end of that, you have this beautiful parched rice. And then you take the rice and you and it, and it falls to the ground. We usually will make sure there's some videos up there of Ronnie Chilton doing this magical thing. And then it come, it, it, you, enter, you cool it off and then you take it in the old days and in the days now too, you could dance on it you know, with your new moccasins. And what you're doing is you're separating the hull from the, or the chaff from the rice itself. And then you winnow it with a new scotch and nog and like up like this in the air and it winnows off or you use a fanning mill and you do it now like that. And that's how you get your wild rice. And then you could do a couple other fancy, fancy things to get like anything else out of it. So that is, uh, we're about a month out, no, three weeks out from wild rice harvest here in the North country. The rice gets ripe at different times on different lakes. And so traditionally, and today, our people travel all throughout our region to get rice, you know. And so I'll, I'll probably go down by Big Sandy and I'll probably, you know, I'll probably go rice over here first. And then I'll go rice up on White Earth, you know, the same thing. And in the crow wing this year, I'm going to rice the crow wing because I've been living on the crow wing system. And um, so that is like essentially what food sovereignty looks like is you can get your main food just like that. And that's how you could sustain yourself. And, you know, I just want to say that, you know, a lot of people there, when your ancestors came over, they had no idea how to live here. We'll go with that description. You know, they had no idea what they're getting into. They, I don't know what they brought over for their food, but good thing we were here to feed y'all because we had all kind of food here. We had these real cool squash. We had all the corn, you know, taught y'all about corn. Too bad about that Sullivan campaign you know, and George Washington burning out the Iroquois villages and all their corn so that they could try to destroy. I mean, the essential of war in American strategy is to destroy the food of the Indians. Mm -hmm. That's what the Iroquois campaign did. You know, the Sullivan campaign of George Washington, 1779, 40 villages burned all their food, turned them into refugees. 
You know, that's the American policy towards Indian people. And certainly, you know, you saw that with the Buffalo campaign on the Buffalo to destroy the Buffalo so that people couldn't eat, you know? So foods, there's a, a centerpiece of your food sovereignty, you know, is maybe it's your corn or maybe it's your Buffalo. In our case, it's our wild rice, you know? And we would say that the United States and state of Minnesota has kind of systemically tried to destroy the wild rice crop of the state of Minnesota, of our territory. And we're down to about, you know, uh, 30%, 40% of our original rice. And that's all up in the North country where we are. And we're fighting tooth and nail just to keep our tooth and nail. That sounds funny. Um, we're fighting very hard to keep our wild rice, you know, from getting destroyed. But um, so it's essential to our food and to our food sovereignty. And it's not only food for people, because if you can feed your people and you can offer hundreds of thousands of pounds of wild rice as a trade item, you know, to the, to the regional economy, that's the history of our people, big trade item, because, you know, we know how to rice. We're the best ricers in the world. Um, but you can control a lot of your destiny if you can control your food. And that's, you know, been a centerpiece of our community's resilience. And then add to that, you know, not to just be all about rice, but just think of this. In 1863, I think it was, this village, you know, 1854, this village uh, 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 on the shore of, Lake Superior, um, those guys harvested 463,000 pounds of maple sugar in a year. Now you're all from Maine, you know, you get the maple sugar thing. I mean, so what's my point here? That's a lot of food sovereignty. You know, you, that, and that's, did I mention that that's sugar without slaves? Mm -hmm. That's sugar without slaves. That's a lot of sugar. And so Anishinaabe people have had a strong, you know, between our lakes, our rivers, our wild rice and our maple syrup or maple sugar, we've had a strong whole, you know, had, had a strong food economy for a long time, you know. But, you know, the fact is, is that colonialism is about destroying food systems and subjugation of other people, you know. And uh, certainly in our territory, we have, we have, you know, hung on to a lot and including our treaty rights, which while we live on reduced land areas, we retain the right to harvest in our 1837 and our 1842, our 1854 and our 1855 treaty territories. And uh, so we continue to harvest in those territories. But, you know, I think about it because, um, you know, settler colonialism is about this, you know, colonialism. I heard Steve Newcomb, who's a scholar, describe colonialism in this in, and, and, he, and referred to that the root of the word colonialism was actually the word colon, is what he said, which means to digest <laughs> one, one culture by another, you know, including your food co colonialism. And you end up with the subjugation of your people because you no longer control your food, you know, and that's starvation. I mean, that's starvation, you know, politics and, and that's history of colonialism. Um, you know, and but part of that is not only, you know, the practice of, of, of the aggression against indigenous people, but also it's it's people coming, you know, bringing their bags with them. Did I say that right? I, what I'm trying to say is, it's like the people who colonized from Europe came from a pastoral landscape. And so they were kind of used to one gig, one lifestyle. You could call it that. I don't know what this is. Get this away. I thought I'd turn her off. And just ask Keisha why she's calling me. Um, the uh, the threats uh, to to wild rice, Winona. Just moving into from settler colonialism and those mindsets around, you know, what agriculture should look like, what our food system should look like. The in addition to you know, taking people off the land, um, you know, and removing them from areas that had the wild rice, even with those treaty rights remaining. The modern agriculture really comes from that mindset of settler colonialism. And the first threats against wild rice was the creation of the patty rice industry, right? Trying to create something right. that we could control. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about how you see settler colonialism continuing, you know, through this trajectory of modern agriculture um, and how you've had to continue your work to protect the wild rice um, from those continued threats? Yeah, I mean, so this is, you know, because indigenous people worked out this covenant 
with the land and our relatives. You know, not to say that things aren't hard, but we got a plan. You know, you don't live for 10,000 years in a place without a pretty good plan. And you don't destroy the ecosystem, right? So the settlers came and they were used to like row crops. Uh, they were used to uh, gardens and tulips and stuff. I'm, you know, I'm not sure. All those, all of those great colonial things. But my point is, is that so they see the great north and it's not cropland. <laughs> it's an entire garden that you just need to know how to take care of. And the garden is your sugar bush in the spring, you know, your, your medicine plants and all of your uh, morel mushrooms, you know, uh, shaggy manes and, uh, and uh, uh, I, I don't know all the ones, but the, all kind of, of things, chicken in the woods, you know, that's your uh, garden is your woods. And then in addition to that, you have, um, you know, all of this, uh, you know, what they call swamp or bog or wetland. And that's where all these medicines are and, and so many different animals and rely on. And so settler colonialism was about draining a lot of that stuff <laughs> in our neck of the woods to make places where you could put in row crops and then continue to subjugate that land to your paradigm of industry, which, which became industrial agriculture. Now, the earliest time when you kind of see this is that Jenks from the University of Minnesota was there. And, uh, oh, where's, I was just looking at his book here. Albert Jenks comes out and he sees the Ojibwe's and he says that wild rice harvest is like a veritable Mardi Gras. <laughs> they, they, they rice all day and then they dance all night. They're very happy. This, they're, we're never going to be able to colonize the Ojibwe's because of their wild rice. That's what he said. He said they have no motivation to, to be subjugated because they got enough wild rice. And so the University of Minnesota is who said about the process of domesticating wild rice. They always got to mess things up and make it harder. You know, and so they figured out how to domesticate our wild rice seeds and then grow it in a diked rice paddy full of chemicals and fertilizers, adapt a combine so they could go in there and harvest it and then create this wild rice industry and, and basically turn it into a row crop. So it's declared the, the grain of Minnesota in the 1970s. It's called the state grain. And within three years, the state grain was actually the state grain of California, pretty much. Because, you know, so clever, the University of Minnesota, to create this wild rice, uh, cultivated wild rice industry. They call it paddy rice. You know, they, we, we don't think that they should be able to call that wild rice. That's tame rice. It's not wild. There's nothing wild about a, a rice paddy. You know, northern in in, but now uh, seventy five percent of the wild rice that they try to grow in Minnesota is grown in California. Almost all the wild rice that you buy at the store, Lund's wild rice, Lundberg's wild rice, that's all from California. Diked rice paddy has nothing to do with us, you know, and has nothing to do with you know our our traditional uh, wild rice. So that was the first round of like how you get settler colonialism, and then you end up in this situation where Indian people no longer control the wild rice economy, you know, and so for us. Hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars worth of wild rice is now made in California and we're marginalized from our own economy, you know, and add to that, of course, we could talk about the maple syrup cartel of Canada, you know, and all various things that kind of take an Anishinaabe food system and take it someplace else. And so we've been resisting this, you know, and Sarah, Sarah came to be with us in our resistance to the patty industry. Margaret Smith, who Sarah talked about, we went out in the 1980s. Um, you know, and we saw that the patty rice industry was trying to drive down the price of wild rice at Lakeside, you know, from a dollar a pound uh, to 50 cents a pound for harvested wild rice. You know, and this is like the main source of income for people in our community. Uh, a lot of people, you know, there's not a lot of jobs up here and we don't actually want most of those jobs because they just make you into a wage slave. Did I say that? Yeah, a wage slave. And we just rather be indigenous and have our full economy so we can make a, a way of life and, and you know, value added income to bring income in from our fabulous wild rice, you know. Uh, so, you know, this is a main source. And then they were driving our price down. And so Margaret Smith and I went out there to the rice landing and, uh, you know, we're way out there in the bush. And there's a couple of these Indian women and she has like about four thousand dollars stuffed into her bra or something. You know, we go out there in the middle of the woods and we buy, you know, there's these white guys out there and then me and Margaret. And uh, they come in and they're trying to push the Indians down in their price. And I said, no, we're going to pay a buck a pound, Margaret says. And so all the Indians come to us and and uh, pretty soon uh, the price of rice is going back up on white earth. And um, that was in the 1980s. 
We litigated in court against Anheuser-Busch, who was selling wild rice, um, state of Minnesota. Um, Anheuser-Busch, and they had two Indians in a canoe on the cover, and it's Onamia Wild Rice. Well, that was from California, Patty. You know, so we battled both the misrepresentation of the wild rice, and we battled the uh, the uh, advent of the patty rice industry. But that, you know, continued to grow, and today most of the wild rice still remains that. Well, in the year 2000, the University of Minnesota shows up with this idea that they're going to genetically engineer the wild rice. And what they said is that they had cracked the DNA sequence of wild rice. And so they're really, really proud of themselves. But, you know, the tribes were like, no, you don't get to genetically engineer it. You already, you know, first of all, uh, that would definitely not mean wild <laughs> if you genetically engineer it. And, you know, it's not, and then it's a different industry. And then, so we, um, you know, it's not a gourmet crop. And so we fought that from 2000 into 2007. And Sarah was with us in some of those battles. You know, we went down there to the, these, these guys, Dean Muska plant, remember that old cat? You know, all these guys were like, it's better for you. Always super patronizing me. All of us like acting like, what's that called? Mansplaining? Let's just say yeah. that. You I remember one say, of the, oh, no. the professors actually said um, to me, I think this was in a room where you weren't. And so being a non-native person, he felt comfortable saying this. He said, you know, if the Indians just understood the science behind this, they'd be okay with it. And I said, oh, no, they understand the science, and that's why they're not okay with this. This is not okay. Um, you know, very, very, I mean, the continuation of that settler colonialism mindset of the Anishinaabe don't know what's best for their community, and, and it's going to take the white academic community to come in and, and save this crop and save these communities. And, um, you know, so we've, we fought that fight around stopping the genetic engineering, which the communities were successful in and and now you've got a new fight on your hands you want to tell us a yeah, little bit about your current fight up, I swear. They, they never quit with the stupid ideas now i know you guys have been out there fighting pipelines too canadian pipeline companies you know um spectra or in our case it's embridge all the same thing put a new pipeline in right through the middle of our wild rice you know just to be clear embridge 75% of the tar sands oil in the country comes in from Enbridge. And that is coming across our territory already. Six big pipelines, you know, affect us. Single largest oil spill in U.S. history, Enbridge and Grand Rapids, not the Kalamazoo spill. You know, but we got this whole other territory that they are just shoving a pipe through right now. And for seven years, we've been fighting them. First, we fought them over the Sandpiper, which we defeated in 2016. And then Enbridge went out and bought the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know. And uh, that was, you know, just like just to show you how uh, late stage fossil fuel addiction and oil politics affect your human rights. There's an example. And right now, 600 people have been arrested so far in northern Minnesota trying to protect our wild rice, including myself. I'm lucky I'm not in jail. I was in jail last week for three days, uh, you know, for protecting wild rice. And, uh, you know, along with 600 other people, we're called the uh, Shell River Seven, <laughs> the seven the seven women that were arrested for trying to protect our wild rice, you know, but that's, that's how crazy it is, you know, just to protect your most sacred food. Our tribe declared wild, the rights of wild rice. You know, I want to say that because in the United States, the laws of corporations supersede the rights of individuals. And that's wrong. And uh, in, in, you know, what we know is, is that, is that wild rice, uh, our tribe said that those rights of wild rice supersede all of us you know, because the rights of nature should be higher than the rights of a corporation. And so we honor our rice and we're committed to her, you know, and so our work continues to protect our wild rice from the Enbridge Line 3 pipeline. And then on the back side of that, there's a bunch of new mining proposals coming in, you know. And so it, it, in, in this point, you know, I'm sitting here looking and uh, we're all, we all live in the same world. My sky is smoky from the forest fires in Canada. And yet they're trying to give us more tar sands, the equivalent of 50 new coal fire power plants. And so we continue our resistance to that. But in, in the center of our resistance is this covenant, this responsibility we have to the creator and to our relatives to take care of Inda King Amin, the very land to which we belong. And in the center of that is this food sovereignty, the ability to feed us and, and all of our generations ahead. You know, and, and I just want to say that, you know, the wild rice is the centerpiece of food sovereignty for Anishinaabe people, and you should all definitely eat wild rice you know, to support us, 
in, in our, you know, in, in our communities for our wild rice. Uh, but, you know, more than that, you know, the implications are, are also larger, you know, because if you, you know, we, we, we want to protect biodiversity, not destroy it. And on the world that we live in, uh, indigenous people are 4% of the world's population, but 70% of the, 75% of the world's biodiversity is in our territories. And you got to protect the wild things. The United Nations even says that. That's what we learned for the coronavirus. Protect the wild things. Stay out of their business, you know. And that's that's why we protect the wild rice, because we live with the wild things, you know, in, in our territory. But also, you know, we're spending a lot of time, and Sarah was early in this, in our work to restore and protect all of our indigenous seeds, you know, and, and I've been, um, you know, honored to be a farmer for most of my life, doing my best at it. And I grow corn, beans, squash, uh, potatoes, uh, tobacco, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, bunch of cool basil and uh, hemp and hemp. And, um, you know, my, my interest has been in, in uh, restoration of traditional foods. So we restore like uh you know, our, our most well-known story is our story of, keep, of, of get, getting the squash back that, you know, like a thousand year old seeds or something that came to us. And now it's called Gete Okosamen. Uh, so we call that squash Gete Okosamen. And, you know, it's uh, about a thousand years old. And uh, and uh, yes, I named that squash. I did. I named it. And I always laugh because white guys name stuff all the time. But our, our name means uh, really cool old squash. And... Uh, I like it because uh, the thing is, is that all those old foods, those heritage seeds are much higher in amino acids and antioxidants and all the super things that you need and lowering calories. And, you know, so these heritage foods that a lot of them are indigenous, you know, that's what we specialize in growing, are, uh, are uh, very good for you. But they're also um, pre and post fossil fuels. You know, they were never raised with a bunch of oil and they know how to survive. And so... Like our squash, I think about our squash, and to me, squash is about uh, promise. Seeds are about promise because you, you pray and you plant them, and then you get a squash. You know, I got all kind of food growing, and you open up a squash, and a squash can last for five, six months. I'm eating squash from last year still. And you know what? So it's like a low-carbon food, but in it, there's another 1,600 seeds. You know, so that's really about promise and commitment and covenant. And it, it reaffirms like the continuity and your place. Because like a squash or a corn, they also need humans. You know, not all food need us. They just need us to not mess them up. But some of these foods need us. And what we know about our work is, you know, we're going to keep protecting our wild rice. But also we're going to keep growing these crops because I've been growing a mandan corn. Very beautiful. And it's it's uh, more drought resistant, you know. So last year, our crop was only about uh, maybe hip high, but everyone had a had a had a corn cob on it, you know. And I looked at the other fields, and they didn't do so good. The GMOs, but our our corn is smart. Its brains in here. It's not in in a gene from Monsanto. So, you know, that's the struggle for food sovereignty is really about, uh, you know, the, the work for food sovereignty is about how you can live for another thousand years. And it's also a story that has really got to be all of our story, because if you have a globalized food system that ne ne needs to get your shrimp from uh, Scotland, you know, you all should eat shrimp because you're in Maine, but maybe we shouldn't eat shrimp where we live. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, I don't, Winona, I don't know we're going to we're going to switch over in a minute to taking some questions from the audience. Yep. But, you know, um, just you and I talked a little bit yesterday about, you know, that we we always have a choice in front of us about the two paths, the two economies. Do we continue down this fossil fuel industrial economy or do we embrace um, the ecological ecosystem focused economy? And I know, you know, we only have a few minutes, but can you describe, you know, what your vision of that ecosystem-based economy is and, and how we, how, how you want us to get there? Yeah, I mean, our prophecies, the same ones that told us to go to the place where the, you know, the shell told us to go to the place where the, 
food grows on the water, said that this was a time called the time of the seventh fire, and we had a choice between two paths. One path, they said, was well-worn and scorched. The other path, they said, is green. Our choice upon which path to embark. That's us, you know, and uh, that's our time now. Us, all of us. And uh, the pandemic, Irindati Roy, the great Indian writer, talks about pandemic as portal. And she said, pandemics have always caused societies to change, and this one is no different. You know, I'm zooming to you. You know, we relocalized. Uh, we increased seed sales and gardening dramatically because we realized that we needed to rebuild local food systems because you couldn't count on something at the store anymore, right? And uh, we got a little smarter and let's stick with it, you know? And then let's, you know, for our idea, our idea of the economy of Northern Minnesota is wild rice. We think that's still a good idea. <laughs> and we're gonna stick to it. We don't think that oil pipelines are a good idea. You know, they're, they're gonna make a profit for a Canadian corporation and mess things up. But we're gonna stick to wild rice and maple sugar and, uh, and squash and I'm taking futures in hemp and buffalo, you know? That's what I think the future looks like. So, and and you up there in Maine, you got a lot of blueberries, and you should you should fix your rivers so the salmon can go there again, you know. And you could get your rice back too if you took care of stuff, you know. Yeah, we're working on it. We have the same vision here with the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association is to have an ecological based economy, not an extraction based economy, and and so we're working on that. Um, but we have some time to take questions from the audience. If anybody has a question, I think somebody's gonna come around with a microphone. Darren's gonna come around and Sean. Um, in the back there. Hi there. Uh, there, hi. I've uh, been so uh, enthralled by your work for many years. Thank you so much for joining this talk. Um, when I was a kid growing up in the 60s, in the spring and fall, the sky was filled with geese and other birds, vast numbers that I think kids today cannot even imagine what the sky looked like during the migration. And many of them were heading to those vast rice fields in the north. What, how do you, how would you, what would you, what can you say about the state of the migratory birds in your territory? You know, there's there's been a decline in the migratory birds significant because of the destruction of ecosystems further south of us. You know, uh, that certainly has occurred. I also know that they still come here, you know, and I look for them each season in succession. And this last uh, couple of years, I started my lake, didn't have so much geese on it, and I was very upset. And then I noticed there was swans there. You know, in my tribe, uh, you know, I don't know, in the 1980s, there was only about 50 pairs of swans left in the state of Minnesota. Huh? In the United States, of uh, these um, uh, trumpeter swans. There's only about 50 pairs. But my tribe um, and the state of Minnesota, when they used to do good things, uh, worked, and now there's 17,000 pairs. Um, and a lot of those are on my lake. And swans are bossy. They're bossier, and they boss the... Boss the uh, the ducks and the Canadian geese off. And so, you know, I believe in uh, try to do your best and keep trying to keep them from messing up stuff and make a good place for your relatives. And then, uh, you know, so it's a significant decline, but I will say that we are doing our part and some of the species are, are getting stronger. And if we keep the wild rice, those guys can hang out. You know, if you, if you destroy the wild rice, they won't have a place to go. So, we keep fighting for those 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 great winged creatures. Great. Do we have another question? Can we see him over here? Right here in the front. Oh, he's bringing you the microphone, so Winona can hear you. <laughs> okay, it's a real simple question. You said to buy your wild rice. I can't hear. You said to um, buy your wild rice. He's asking about um, buying wild rice. Where so where can where can the great folks here in Maine get wild get rice? It. Is that and where we're how headed? How do you identify it as authentic? Did ah, you catch that one? Well, you Anna? could always. You yes, you could always order from us at Honor the Earth. It's pipeline free. 
<laughs> or you can order from Native Harvest. You need like Minnesota need to say hand harvested native wild rice on it. You know, and you also want like our stuff is uh, some some people gas parch. I don't think that's right. I think you should wood parch. You know, like I think old school. But Honor the Earth has a bunch of wild rice. Native Harvest has rice. You know, I think Leech Lake has rice too. And um, and Boyce Ford has rice. We're going to have some rice cook-offs this year and who has the best rice each season. And uh, you should definitely, you know, see that and support that. Thank you for, for asking. Yeah. Earth.org. And, and yeah, I would encourage folks huh? to, to buy from Honor the Earth. Oh, yeah. I'm going to show you some color here. Oh, great. Yeah, here, wait, I don't know how to do this. How do I do this? Oh, wait. Oh, Christ, Don, how am I do this? <laughs> here. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Yes. Thank yeah, you. so why Dominus native persisted. harvested okay, wild so rice is much is, lighter. Yeah. If yeah. it's black, it's not the real thing. The patty rice. Y'all get if that? It's, if it's if it's real black, ours is a light brown. If it's black, not the real thing. Don't buy Uncle Ben's. Don't buy Gourmet House. Those guys are bad guys. <laughs> and I do hope everybody gets the chance to enjoy some some real native hand harvested wood parched wild rice. It's incredible. It's it's um, very delicious and amazing and nu and nutritious. Very good for you. Very healthy. Um, any other questions? We might have time for one or two more. Over here in the back, over here. Oh, that question was sorry. Oh, it's just... oh I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here, teaching us. I wondered about um, if you have relatives across the lakes in Canada who also are as connected with the wild rice, and what is their, um, uh, in a other than the pipelines, are there other, um, is there, are there other either policy or kind of um, regional um, uh, concern, not concerns, no, um, ways that they're fighting for their sovereignty in Canada for in, around wild rice? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us are trying to protect our wild rice. You know, Canada's not a very nice country. I say that, uh, you know, now that the boarding school atrocities are coming out, the residential schools and those thousands of Indian children murdered <laughs> in residential schools. Well, Canada's 75% of the world's mining corporations are Canadian, and they're busy destroying the wild rice as fast as they can up there. You know, they put a halt on industrial operations in what's called the Ring of Fire, which is the heart of wild rice territory in Canada, they put a heart a, a whole halt on it because of the forest fires, you know. Um, but um, you know, Canada's policies have really taken uh, um, taken a lot of territory from Ojibwe people, and also um, given a lot of rice lakes to non-Indian people to harvest on. But some of those tribes really retain that, and we all fight to keep our wild rice. You know, but it, you know, in the in the larger picture, you know, we need to support indigenous people and in our and our right to keep our land and our waters. But also, what we really need is this transition to a just economy or to a just transition because Canada will keep mining and they'll keep putting tar sands oil pipelines out there until we until we move along, and we are moving along. Um, you know, but um, you know, and you know, as as most of you know, the tar sands is losing investment much faster than it's gaining any. The Saudis all sold their stock in it and Shell, Royal Dutch Shell is moving out and Chevron. You know, so my point is, is that is that do the right thing and uh, push Canada to quit being absolute jerks to the environment and indigenous people. You know, they're I mean, they're brutal. You know, everybody thought that, you know, I don't know what they all thought about Canada, but rethink that one, would you? <laughs> all right. Do we have any last questions? One more, right that here in the middle. Oh, Canada, sorry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have two more. Maybe we have time for two quick questions in the middle and then right over here. I'm wondering, are there a lot of young people leaving the, the area and is that gonna affect 
the harvesting in the future of the wild rice? Well, I think actually that more people are coming home. A lot of people left and we were forced off. We were made refugees. You know, uh, like I said, just like with the Iroquois, the largest refugee population in Minnesota was Ojibwe people for many years. You know, and now we have other refugee communities that have come in. We were forced to the Twin Cities and forced out by uh, relocation programs. And, um, you know, I myself was raised off reservation, but I moved back when I turned 22 or 23. I lived there now for 40 years, you know, so most of my life. In my own community, my my point is is that uh, you know we we want a place for our people, and you go out there in um, wild rice uh, time, and I'll tell you that a lot of the people that are paddling and ricing are men in their twenties, um, and they're strong and they're good, and and uh, that you know I see them the happiest ever when they're ricing. You know, my people, when you get to be Anishinaabe, you're you're really happy, you know, and that's what's going on with our with our people. And uh, Sarah witnessed that, you know, you get everything messed up in the world. But when you're out there in the middle of wild rice with your people, you know, your world is perfect, just like it was for your ancestors. All right. Last question, Helen. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for your time and energy. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk really briefly about the concept of intellectual property and how that plays into your fight for seed sovereignty and general food sovereignty. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, property laws are really constructs of, of uh, you know, European systems. But basically, you got to quit taking stuff that's not yours. <laughs> so, you know, like for instance, a lot of our indigenous, you know, knowledge systems or the prop or or our wild rice, you know, that's something that's like uh our covenant was worked out with the creator and and this and the taking of, you know, whether it's our our uh our you know teachings or our knowledge um in an extractive manner of uh settler economics and academics is something that uh, we're done with. You know, so for instance, um, we have a lot of knowledge. Um, I'm having this interesting conversation about clams. And, you know, they're asking me for a traditional knowledge about clams. And I'm thinking, you know, um, you know, uh, we want to protect uh, uh, a lot of our, our most things because we don't need them all extracted out. All of our intellectual, all of our knowledge needs to be protected and uh, relearned in our community. Uh, but, you know, I think that what you're talking about generally is like, you know, we know how to do all kind of stuff and uh, we want the we want to be acknowledged for it. If we're going to if we if we uh, enter in a trade agreement, not just it's stolen from us, uh, all of our technology and all of our knowledge, how to how to how to survive or how to live. But the idea is, is that it belongs to the people. It's along with a cultural property right. It's an intellectual property right, spiritual property right, land, water rights. Those still belong to your people, and, and you don't get to take those. Hey, I froze. <laughs> We're going to have to wrap it up here today, although we could definitely continue talking for a much longer time. There's so much to get into here, but it's so nice to, to see you again, Winona. Chimagwich, for all of your work and for being here today. Thank you um, for all that you do, and um, keep up the great uh, fight that you're doing. So, thank you. Yeah, Miigwech. Thanks for the privilege of being with you all. Miigwech. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Helen. And thanks, Winona. That was that was great. I, you know, I've got this little notebook that I that I use. I I think I blew through half of it during those <laughs> that hour. Indakina bin, right? the very land to which we belong. Um, thank you. And th that really tied back nicely to Michael, some of Michael Pollan's work on, on Monday also. So we're going to take a little break. Don't go anywhere, don't, because it's really wet outside. And at 11, we're welcoming Martha Stewart here, who will be in conversation with Jonathan Webb, um, who is the founder, CEO of App Harvest. 
and that'll be a very different but also interesting discussion. So stick around, grab some coffee, and stay warm. <laughs>